Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is uh, Wednesday, March 11th, 2015, and we are right in the middle of Open Education Week. And Karen Fassenpower, oh, I don't know, a little while ago, said, do you want me to get a bunch of really cool people to come and talk about open education? And I said, yeah, let's do that. And so this is Karen's party. No, uh, we'll see. Um, we we don't have, uh, but but seriously, we do not have a very um, like spelled out agenda. We do want to think about what open practice, open education um, means in the context of um, our current time. Um, and uh, in pre-show, we very quickly we came up with a couple of interesting questions. But let's first go around and get introductions. Tell us who you are, what you do, what you teach, and um, a little bit about, you know, how your that, that word open education and what comes to mind when you think of it. Um, Ian, would you mind starting us off? Just sure, I'll start us off. Um, so my name is Ian O'Byrne. I am uh, currently an assistant professor of uh, educational technologies at University of New Haven. Um, I build and break things online. Um, I, it's fun every year when we have this meeting because it, you know, we basically go and we define what does open mean for us. <laughs> and a year later then I come back and I say, how silly, how silly I was thinking that open was that basic. Um, so last year I was thinking about it. Last year I said that um, open, uh, as Doug Belshaw put it, open is an attitude and open is serendipity. And I want to push our thinking. Um, I was watching how we got to here with Steven Johnson uh, on PBS, and he was talking about glass. Um, and one of the things that he said that I, I'd like to talk about later is he talked about um, the, the economic term, I believe, of knowledge spillover. And so one of the cool things that strikes me is that because I'm open and I'm online and I share and I can connect with others, the internet now gives us this place to sort of like just connect and interact and get great ideas and just uh, convene. And, and, and uh, I think it's through open and open ed resources and the internet as a tool that we can do that. So with that, I'll zip it up. Great introduction. Thank you. Joe. Oh, me. So I'm Joe Dillon, and I'm coming from a basement in Denver, Colorado. And I, I work nearby here in a, in a large urban suburb of Denver called Aurora, and I'm a technology coordinator in the Aurora Public Schools. And then I'm also uh, uh, to be a teacher consultant at the Denver Writing Project. And one of the things I do, so in my day job, I am I'm interested in open sharing teacher practices because I just believe in teachers teaching teachers, and I think, you know, open doors to classrooms are important and you know open sharing of things that work and promising practices are, are vital and then with NWP I get to I get the opportunity to work on the CL MOOC every summer and that's a place where we think about um, you know opening up online professional learning or online learning opportunities to, to folks and, and we think through open and in a lot of ways mostly by you know trying to insight making and learning and thinking about connected learning and so we can talk more about that but you know that's those are some of the contexts I think about open in and then I, I think one of the things that I'm I'm excited about in terms of the promise of open practices is that the threshold is really low right the idea that you know we can be engaged in open practice when we're just thinking in public online and that that can take all kinds of forms it can be as simple as a tweet so because those are my opening comments, and like Ian, I'll zip it. <laughs> Karen, I just call on you. Uh, um, I'm Karen Fastenpower, and I live in Arizona, and I do um, freelance work with online community building. And I've I've been a advocate for, particularly for open educational resources for a number of years, probably six or seven years. Um, have done work with the Hewlett Foundation and others around very specifically open educational resources. And in that context, we have a very um, sort of tight definition of what open means. There's actually a legal definition. 
Um, and I think what's how my thinking on this topic has changed over the last couple years is really going beyond um, OER, which is sort of a subset of the bigger um, open space, and thinking about what does open mean outside of OER, and you know where are the overlaps and where where are there not overlaps? Because I've seen now a lot of examples of where even OER can be used. Um, in non-open spaces and, in, and not to advance open practice. And I've seen um, open practice used with proprietary materials. So thinking through that and sort of coming to a personal place of thinking that open practice is, is, more, is potentially more um, beneficial from a learning standpoint. Um, but again, just where, where those two things can sort of overlap and help each other move along. And I'm happy to be here with such a nice bunch of people. Catherine, welcome. Oops, uh, helps if I unmute myself here. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so my name is Catherine Kennedy. I am a senior researcher at Michigan Virtual University's Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute. Say that five times fast at 9.30 on the East Coast. <laughs> that was Kennedy, right? It, it yes, blanked Kennedy. out there a little bit. Yes, sorry. Okay, Kennedy. Good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, my link to this is uh, I was wrangled in uh, very nicely by Verena Roberts, who uh, we've been friends for a very long time, uh, going to the INA Call Symposium together, and also working on a lot of uh, projects together. Um, I was, before uh, coming on to MVLRI, uh, part of INA Call's um, uh, crew, and I was a director of research there. Prior to that, I, I worked a lot with... Um, teacher education program. So I was a, a professor at Georgia Southern University and one of the things when I'm thinking about open uh, open learning is thinking about how we're, we're starting to see it go more and more into uh, primary and secondary education and my concern being prior uh, pre-service uh, teacher educator was I was always trying to get them to really break the mold or you know what they call the sacred cow trying to get past the idea of having these strict boundaries and and teaching teachers how to be more open to open learning uh, and then maybe hopefully if we're teaching them to be more open to open learning at their teacher education program going out there and spreading the word in their education environments that they're getting into as well uh, we see a lot of that in Florida right now anyway in the United States so um, that's where I bring uh, into the conversation, and I'm going to sign off for that. Welcome. Thank you. And it's not, is it Lee? It's not Lee. <laughs> Sorry. It is Lee. Go ahead. It is Lee. It is yes. Lee. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Lee Graham. I'm yes. in Juneau, Alaska. Yeah. And, uh, and I uh, teach educational technology and I'm sort of teach in the open all the time and so my interest in the open is the change in dynamic that happens in in student populations so like Catherine was or, or uh, yes like Catherine was talking about the sort of breaking that that unwritten um, rule that we can't criticize the way things are, we can't talk outside of our little group about things that are important in education. I'm real excited to move beyond the walled garden and be a part of the larger conversation. And so that's really all of my classes are open educational resource for people who want to use them. And then my classes are on Twitter. Uh, where that actually they're talking right now in Diffie MOOC. I'm supposed to be there, but I begged off so I could be here. Um, but they're great because they're in charge of it. And so that's what I see in open learning with the teachers I teach is just this vitality that comes in when we work in the open that doesn't seem to happen when we're in Blackboard. So, uh, and, and also I'm sort of an anarchist at heart, I think. And so I just kind of like, I like the idea that there might never, like, 
in in a hundred years there might not be such a thing as college. Now I don't know what I'd do with my time, and Ian, I'm not trying to get you out of a job either, but. But uh, I like the idea that anybody could learn whatever they wanted to and then gr get the credential by showing proficiency. I, I think that that's remarkable. And so that's right. So I'm a, I'm a maverick <laughs> in the good sense of the word. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I just like throwing everything out there. And it makes me nervous sometimes because I think eventually – something's going to happen with a student who doesn't realize they're in the open and that's going to be a disaster and so that worries me I've been thinking about actually and of course if you ever talk to a lawyer they say don't do this at all ever under any circumstances um, so that makes me think maybe we need contracts or something but I, I love the open and and I continue to do it even if it means um, it might come back on me one day. And that's me. Wow. Lots of good <laughs> questions there. Thank you um, for that introduction. Uh, Rhonda, you'll need to unmute. Is she there? Yeah, there you go. Hey. Hi. Oh. Welcome. Oh. Toggle one more time, and then you'll be unmuted. There you go. We can hear you, yes. Yeah. Okay, Perfect. good. I don't see it unmuted. Hi, I'm Miranda Jessen. I'm uh, one of your token Canadians, I guess, tonight. Um, uh, I'm a media and computer teacher, um, and uh, right now I'm actually working for Alberta Education on uh, curriculum development for an, uh, an options curriculum. And I, I was less into open when I was in the classroom, actually. It's been interesting listening to people, um, so many questions that are being raised. But I'm, I'm really interested in open um, for the possibilities that it provides, not just for um, access to resources for K-12 teachers, which is great, but also that potential for making and for contributions for students that they can make. Um, and um, that's what I like to think about when I think about OPEN. And um, thanks for having me in this conversation tonight. You're welcome. Sharon. And me Perfect. unmute. There we go. Okay. Um, well, I'm the, one of the reasons I tuned in is um, I'm planning on doing a dissertation on um, how we transition from all the wonderful K-12 things we're doing into higher ed. And um, in the regular classroom or online, which is what I do, how do we incorporate these wonderful things that? Um, the creative K-12 and core standards and all of that is happening uh, into into higher ed in the traditional classroom where there are lectures or they record their lecture or whatever. So I'm wondering um, what is out there, because um, I know for me I teach writing online. So I do Google Hangouts, we do peer editing, um, I bring in a lot of resources uh, for them that are digital. Um, but at but at large, by and large, how many higher ed folks are aboard on board? Cool. That's my question. Yeah. No, I mean, what's so interesting is that um, higher ed people wonder how many K twelve people are on board. So it's <laughs> great. It's a shared enterprise, <laughs> and we well, should. I, be I, I know many yeah. the K twelve people that I know are doing amazing. I, it's mm -hmm. just yeah, different camps. No, that's, yeah, that's very cool. Welcome. Thank you. Verna. I'm uh, Rena Roberts. I'm Rena, from Cal sorry, yeah, sorry. That's okay. That's, no, that's okay. <laughs> Everyone does uh, that. Right? Yeah, everyone, sure. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm from um, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And uh, you'll hear a lot of Alberta out here because I believe Alberta is honestly leading the way in open. It might be a little bit because of some amazing people. <laughs> Alberta and like Rhonda who happens to be here tonight and Lee and Ian actually helped me write an article a research article and and we kind of summarize what was happening and we've got some great policies happening in Alberta but when we think of open I'm here to celebrate like Ian or Karen I don't know how many I guess I've done this a couple of years now we've come together and we've met and I liked that 
you in really encouraged us to invite more people because there are more people at the table, more people know what open learning is and that's really exciting for me. Um, and then when I think of what we just said about open learning in K-12 and higher ed, I was ecstatic to see higher ed say open practice as opposed to OER and open textbooks the other day because I was the one that went to an open conference a couple of years ago and I didn't know what CC Commons was but I knew what open learning was so I went in with a totally different attitude um, so OER has always been a part of I guess what I'm curious about and what I do and I teach um, and when I think about teaching the open, I mean, I'd love to say that I'm a social media connoisseur and we do all these great and amazing things, but I've learned you really have to do things in stages and you have to be open to the fact that we have to take our time and we have to encourage everyone to learn at their own pace. Um, and so open means um, creating those connections between the future potential for each one of your students and their opportunities and opening their minds to that potential. And that that means a digital tool or a different way of doing things or focusing on evidence of learning. Um, that's what it means to me. So I think, like Karen kind of said earlier too, the open to me has really changed from an only digital kind of idea to more pedagogical and um, that open mindset again that Ian mentioned too. Okay, I'll stop. Great. And just before Christina g jumps in here, I'll, I'll say I'm Paul Allison and I work with the New York City Writing Project and a uh, new school in the Bronx called New Directions. And one of the one of the issues that I'm hearing as I hear you all kind of describing things is, and what I've been interested in is, is how to get things organized so that there is access to materials. Um, so that's, uh, so that feels like a really important thing. You, I mean, there can be lots of resources out there, and uh, but if teachers can't easily find them and access them, and if students can't, then you know they don't get used to so much. So that's one of the questions I have. Christina, welcome. Hi. Thanks. <laughs> so, is the prompt what 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 open? It's, why it's, open? it's who are you and what's what's up. Great. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Christina Cantrell, and I work for the National Writing Project, and I've learned um, from you all, actually, uh, through working with Writing Project teachers about open. And I was thinking about, like, um, just uh, the ways that so many of my colleagues at the Writing Project have... Um, tend to, because they're actively involved in inquiries into their work, they're sort of always asking questions about their work and sharing their questions about their work, and to me that's really open practice that I, I have learned from spending time with um, writing project educators and this, this idea of being open with your questions. And then, you know, People like Paul led us into online spaces where we're asking these questions online all the time, you know, in open and having conversations about them in open spaces. And then I was just thinking about the year that um, a colleague from a Kansas City Area Writing Project, Steve J. Moore, blogged his entire first year of teaching. And I just remember I was so just like, wow, that is impressive. <laughs> and you know, so like these sort of open practices kind of seeped into these online environments and I feel like that's um, where I've been learning about how to be open. So been sort of trying to take it on as personal practice and I think, you know, it does, it is something to, it comes in stages, I think. Um, as you said, like it's gradual and takes practice and I've been sort of personally trying to practice it and then in work we've been experimenting with it. And I, I assume that Joe talked about, the, or Karen talked about the MOOC, so... Um, it did mention, yes. Okay, great. Um, and then right now I'm also teaching at Arcadia University um, a mm -hmm. class called Equity and Connected Learning, and I'm really trying to follow the um, Connected Courses model and use Reclaim Domain and some of the tools that um, um, 
have been created out of um, uh, Jim Groom's work and DS106 to create a class that is open. So that's been an interesting experiment that I'm in the middle of. And in fact, just finished one of our online gatherings that I've modeled off of TTT also. <laughs> so. so I'm impressed with how many people talked about um, open is just the place to start. It's what, what you do with it afterwards that feels important. Um, so that's one thing that I've noticed, but I, I do want to leave this open for other people um, to say what you notice and where what what you think we could all talk about here. Um, let me throw out one other idea, and that is that um, it was mentioned by a couple of people that there's this phrase called open practice. And I noticed Karen starting to title you know, tonight's episode as open practice, too. So what is open practice? And then Karen mentioned, if you want to say it, Karen, but um, that there was some question about can you do open practice and still have us be within a school curriculum that you know, is about the Common Core? So those are some of the issues we can throw out there in addition to the ones that you all just said. Who wants to jump in with what you're thinking here? I guess I'd be interested in hearing more about why you can't do open practice and connect to the Common Core. I'm not making that connection. So the specific context that this conversation was in was about a post that I had written about open practice. And I think, I don't know if open practice is the right term or if there's a term of choice for that. Some people call it open learning or open pedagogy. I think, I don't know if the term matters or not, but I'll just, I'll just say open practice to cover all that. But we were sort of brainstorming what, what does that mean and I was talking about learner choice and flexibility as one aspect of that. So sort of some aspects were learner choice and flexibility, collaboration and sharing, and then transparency and open access. So that's the kind of not behind a firewall and accessible part. And I'll just read a couple sentences because this is what drew the response that this can't work in, in most K-12 schools. Um, I said, this is all about learner agency. In an open learning environment, the learners have authentic choice over what they do, both in terms of process and product, and they act in a way that is self-directed. By definition, this means that not every student is doing the same thing at the same time. It precludes things like standardization, whole group, instruct whole group direct instruction, and scripted paced lessons. And so the, the response to that mm -hmm. um, from someone was, if that first bullet is the case, mm -hmm. Um, then it falls outside of what schools call curriculum, and it is certainly at odds with Common Core. That was sort of so. That was sort of where the conversation started, and then a, a few of us had a, a further conversation. And I would, I'll just say that I think we would probably all agree that you can do open practice within Common Core. But in defense of the person who said you can't, I, I think. The confusion is between what the Common Core standards actually say and how they're being implemented and what exactly. people's perception, right? And, exactly. and again, just to defend the point, um, I used to have a boss who always said, perception is reality. And so I think there's something there you have to really, you know, it's easy to just dismiss it and go, well, of course you can do open practice in Common Core, but yeah. I'd like to hear more discussion on that. I don't, I don't think we should dismiss it, but I would just say, you know, right now that one of the classes I'm teaching in the open is Diffie MOOC, and we're studying problem-based learning this week. And so problem-based learning meets all the same criteria of open education that you, you mentioned um, and can absolutely connect with Common Core. In fact, we're doing it and connecting it with language art standards in Common Core. So... Yeah, so, but it is that standardized view, I think, that uh, that is getting in the way, the Diffie MOOC, and it's, it's Givercraft that we're doing right now that is in Minecraft, so it's open, but it's K-12 through students on a dedicated server, and they're building to meet Common Core standards and then writing in Wikispaces. 
Can I? Can I? I want to jump in and say that uh, about Common Core. The the last time I heard somebody say what you just said, Karen, um, I, like uh, on, in the subway on the way home. <laughs> I wish I had said. I'm going to say it now. Um, like you know what? Yeah, we can have the document and we can make them come alive again. And and yeah, it's the, everyone. You know, you can be opposed to the test, but be but be you know, but think that the standards are all right. I hear all that. But what about like moving back one step and asking, should there even be a set of standards that are you know established by somebody outside of smaller communities, and then you know people try to have to measure up against them? So even the whole concept of having this document, I think I want to question sometimes. So, well, I, I would throw out a couple, a couple advantages to having some kind of standards and I, I think again the implementation of this is so far from what the standards are that I think it's hard not to mix them up but one, one advantage of having some kind of standards that are implemented on a, on a mostly national basis is the potential to save literally billions of dollars in curriculum development developing for every individual state and there there is actually now um, mm -hmm. k-12 open licensed core curriculum that is free and and is creative commons licensed that could if we could take the six billion dollars or some portion of it that's spent on instructional materials that goes to commercial publishers I would say taking advantage of a fractionalized system and put that into teachers instead we would have a different educational system so so that's one point I forget what the second one oh mobility of students and just I mean mobility of students is at a at a all-time high and it's gonna it's just gonna keep growing and to have every individual school sort of reinventing the wheel I think it, I think it's difficult now I think there's a lot of flexibility within the standards so again not talking about the implementation but that would be my reaction I think the standards I'm, I'm not going to talk long about this because that is something as an anarchist that I can really talk about a lot um, but I, you know I don't like that standards were created so that corporations could make millions of dollars off of education. I hate that. I like that um, because there are standards we can share open resources. Um, but and, and I love the standards themselves, but as long as the standardized testing thing continues, uh, I think they're going to continue to get the perverted and corrupted and used in inappropriate ways. and. Uh, it's remarkable and to me the amount of curriculum control that's been taken out of teachers hands the number of teachers that aren't allowed to create their own curriculum is astounding to me um, it's a completely different world than when I taught middle school ten years ago more than that too bad sorry but a long time ago I was able to create my own units I teach them how to create units now and they wonder when am I ever going to use this I think, well, can I say, we don't have Common Core, obviously, in Canada. We live the land of freedom and <laughs> opportunity, shall we say. However, that being said, one of the projects that we're working on right now is we're trying to create an English 10 course across our whole country. And, and the way we did it was instead of being told what our curriculum is or what our course standards are, we together are bringing the curriculum from each province. We're comparing those curriculums and it is fascinating to me I just wish I've actually started to record the conversations between the teachers who are saying oh this is really wordy or I thought we were wordy or wow look at the similarities look at the differences so to me thinking about open and the open opportunities is literally just being open and it's a my the whole mindset thing really no it's really a mindset thing to have those conversations and, and bringing people to the table and having a Google Hangout about comparing curriculum from different provinces or different states and then doing it all in the open and then the whole course is being developed together we're doing it together and we're watching that process together um, I guess this, it's 
Can I? Go on, sorry. It was English 10? Is that it's what just you... English 10. It's English 10. The whole goal was in a grade 10. We figured, <laughs> the English teachers, that a grade 10 in the world, you know, we can make the assumption we should all be at a certain level, and we're professionals, and we're in Canada, and we are teaching in different provinces, and we're all certified, so let's come together. And we're so doing does, it. Does yeah. everybody read Shakespeare? Everybody reads Shakespeare. Everybody reads poetry. And then and then what we said was, Karen, you'll love this. Please don't come if you want to create a project. Come with a project you've already created. <laughs> Is it good Shakespeare, Verena, or are you making them read Julius Caesar? <laughs> I, I'm not making any of I'm just bringing them together, and I'm focused Replace on Replace it with a comedy, for God's sake. I'm I, sorry. Well, that's a, but to have the opportunity to have these conversations is is what it, like that's what open is all about. That's the importance. And so it's the core standard. You could have the same conversation about core standards for math in grade eight. That's what I'm getting at. It's just the fact that you bring people together and can compare and think of alternative ways to do things to meet the needs of every individual, every learner, and like um, the access piece. Paul, I told that I couldn't have said it. Like access is what it's all about. That you have access to do this, and that when you don't have access, you're given alternatives, so you don't feel like you don't have access. In in our wealthy nations. Okay, that's all. <laughs> Jump in, folks. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take it in a different route, I guess. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about, as everybody was talking, the idea, and I guess this is more of a question for the group, um, we had a MOOC that was run by uh, Kent State University that brought together in-service teachers, pre-service teachers, and as actually high school students who were interested in teaching eventually. Um, is something that is that open, uh, it was a MOOC um, on K-12, uh, you know, um, digital nation or digital um, uh, generation type learning. Uh, is that type of, of cross, I guess, cross-generational open learning something that we should be think of, thinking about as well in this open learning conversation? You're, you're making it so much harder. It's hard enough to, to collaborate across the people we are supposed to know. Now you're adding other grades. I, I think it's valuable, but wow, even more challenging. It, it's so valuable, though, because that's, of course, that's one reason I enjoy the Open is because I've often taught in small places where we're isolated to a certain extent, and the only people we talk to are people like ourselves. And so to get into the open and to see the different perspectives that exist is more of an education in a lot of cases than the curriculum is. And and then um, my students and Verena and Vicki Davis, we all did the gamified piece so that my students were actually collaborating with ninth graders to create these rubrics. And it was just remarkable. I mean, my students who were all the way up to 65 years old, learned so much from these kids, and the kids learned from us. And, and I think that the intergenerational piece for people of our, I'm going to say of our age, some of you are probably much younger than me, but people of my age is, is really important because too often, you know, we remember learning is that thing we did and now it's done and now we know and we don't do it anymore. And so opening up our eyes to the ongoing process and that it doesn't hurt um, is helpful and that even the ninth graders have a lot to teach us. I think it's, it's really transformational. Yeah, I think we need to start providing opportunities um, for ourselves, for, you know, I work primarily with pre-service teachers, um, provide opportunities for them to explore and create and share in open environments, openly online. I think we need to provide opportunities for um, our K-12 students to just go online and share um, and, and do so uh, in a somewhat chaperoned approach. So as was mentioned before, you know, there might be a time when open comes to bite us. 
um, you know, provide an opportunity to chaperone our students, chaperone, um, you know, the people, you know, our students either in pre-service or K-12 or in higher ed. Um, this came up, this very question came up earlier today. Uh, Christy Pytash and I were on uh, a webinar for the, you know, the Virtual Learning Institute, um, and, and a bunch of great educators were on the call, and they basically said, we like what you're talking about. How do we do this? Um, and that's what we suggested is, number one, uh, create digital copies of everything that you possibly can. Put those online and share. You know, if you might think that you're creating a graphic organizer for your third grade students and it's synthesis and it doesn't really matter, well, you know what? In higher ed, I'm interested in that because I'm trying to get my students to figure out how to synthesize across sources. So create digital copies, blog and reflect on every possible thing that you possibly can, um, and then provide opportunities to get out and learn. Um, you know, an example is the Walk My World project, the Walk My World MOOC that we are nearing the end of right now. Uh, Walk My World basically started because a bunch of us, uh, we met at, at, at NCT and LRA, we basically said, you know what, we want, we we're pre-service educators, uh, we were instructors, and we basically said, you know what, we, let's, let's have fun, let's play, let's get um, our students together online in this, you know, we have the internet and we are savvy or dumb enough to try this out, let's uh, play. And let's, let's use technology as a third space to let our, our students get out there and play. And so now what you have is K-12 students, you have teacher educators, you have instructors, you have higher ed, you have all these people just online openly sharing and playing. And so I think it's providing those opportunities, chaperoning people so nobody gets hurt. Um, and that when she, once you have that little that gateway drug, then better things can happen. Yeah, I'd like to piggyback on that a little bit. I, I hope it's okay if I jump in. Because uh, I think one of the things that we have been talking in the chat a little bit about MOOCs and, and you know, sort of different types of MOOCs. And uh, one of the things that was interesting to me as we were thinking about, you know, how we do MOOC, MOOC-like professional learning that stays true to, you know, kind of a, you know, a learner-centered ethos. Um, I struggle with the concept of MOOC dropouts because... I think it's just a way of, of kind of framing the experience in a negative way that doesn't doesn't allow for people to come and go as they please, which they clearly are doing online, and it's sort of applying some formal historical educational construct to to people dipping their toes in. So, Ian, when you're talking about people want to know, you know, how do I do this? I think we have to pay attention, you know, to how we're framing, you know, entry into these open spaces like is it something you have to take a whole college course to do in order to be a participant you know I would say no and, and it's more important to say nobody's a dropout everyone's a participant and any contribution is, is worthy and when we when we intentionally lower that threshold then we're really opening a door and when we you know one of the themes another theme I'm noticing in the chat is you know many of us have sort of you know changed our definition of like what open is because we see potential in different practices. So, you know, certainly we like certain kinds of resources more, you know, than others, and we might like certain core structures more than others. But I, I know in the past when I've looked at certain MOOCs that looked very, you know, teacher centered and you know, quiz intensive, I would want to label it. But I've been, you know, I've had my my mind changed by um, having learners just talk to me about, you know how great it is to navigate through all those resources and find what they need. And so, though I might have dismissed a course because it had quizzes, um, now I'm having to change my own definition. So just being careful where we set the threshold for this stuff, and especially if we if we've sort of had little experience, you know, had enough experience to know enough to be dangerous, you know, that we don't, that we don't, you know, we don't make it sound um, unachievable. It, just to just very quickly, but it, I think that's something that's interesting and something that we're going to have to keep looking at uh, because if something is structured like a course, and particularly a traditional course, um, there's a particular person who's attracted to it, reason to take it, way to achieve it, and yes, then 
the idea of dropout becomes something negative. You know, I started and I didn't finish because maybe because I that was my goal, and that's the only reason it's dropout is even a thing. If that was your goal to finish, then okay. Um, but I'm really interested in this the the more organic flowing kinds of MOOCs, and I'm wondering if those aren't going to be the ones that we see. I mean, I, I hear your point. I agree with your point um, about people finding these helpful and interesting and and quality in many cases. But I'm not sure that that's the way that we learn now. I'm not sure that taking the learning into the organic environment isn't more effective than putting it aside as something else, whether you call it a MOOC or whatever you call it, a class, whatever you call it, is is the organic you know, way of, and for someone interested in organizing open ed, I'm sure that's an interesting question too. So, but it's something that goes through my mind. I don't think that things that are less organic are as naturally and authentically effective. Do you do you ever get the question I asked like to Paul and Karen everybody like how how did you get here like they're asking you how do you learn this way uh, I'm getting a lot of people asking well I want to I want to speed up my teachers I want them to learn online like you are Rena I want them like you are like you know like 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 and making those comparisons but they want to do it in that as as speedy process as possible because it's they are seeing it as a new trend I think the new shiny object. And they don't see the years, like Karen, you said, what, six or seven years you've been touting the amazingness of OER, <laughs> for example. It's not something that people get overnight. Are you getting those questions yet? or And how do you answer them? Well, and I'm going to jump in, too. Like, already from listening to all of you and where you're coming from, like, everyone's coming from such a different perspective, right? Like. When uh, even when people ask me, well, you know, one time it was like that. Everyone comes from so different. So how can you say, here is how you do it? But I agree, people are asking because they're curious. So go ahead, answer Verena's question. That's my postscript to it, I guess. Yeah, I definitely get that question. I get, um, you know, a, a superintendent will call me out for coffee and and say, you know. Um, my middle school has this culture and they, you know, all the teachers use technology and they're blogging and the kids are doing great stuff and then the kids go to high school and nothing happens. So how do I take that over here and make it happen over there? Um, and, I mean, we're, to me, we're talking about culture. Um, and, and what you're describing there, I think we're talking about, to me, it's individual personal dispositions. I think it's you know, it's attitudes and aptitudes. So all the great work on dispositions in, you know, in elementary and, and early literacy, I think it, it, it builds off of that. It's stuff that takes time. It's, it's, a, it's a general, um, you know, it's, it's a habit of mind. I think it's, I, I would assume that for most of us, you know, we are also willing to try other new things. We try new foods. We're willing to get out there and, and live life and try things. And um, we probably have a, low fear of failure, um, you know, we iterate on most things in our lives, as, as Lee's saying there, you know, we have patience, we are flexible, we are persistent, um, you know, we are reflective, and I think that this technology wrap is one, you know, lens or one aspect of it, but I think it's individual dispositions, and you can build those up, but it takes a lot of time. I was I guess, thinking, um, can, can I just throw, go ahead, uh, Christina, we'll go to you next. <laughs> um, just to throw one example out, um, we've been working with, with a teacher who um, wants his students to respond to uh, uh, some literature, and um, his, his first notion on youth voices was to post something himself, his own reflection about a text and then to have students respond to that text, right? Um, and I said, uh, yeah, but what do the kids think about the text, right? So so, so there, there was some technology and stuff that we talked to him about and, and helped him kind of manage. Um, but the bigger question was, 
was that pedagogical question of, you know, kids asking their own questions about text, not responding to a teacher's question about text. So, you know, <laughs> it's about technology. It's about making, you know, accessing stuff and, and how, how it gets presented online and all that. But it's also about that bigger question of giving young people the opportunity to ask their own questions and to be the center of their learning in some way. So that's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that helped, but Christina, what do you think? Well, I think I was starting to, I was just kind of trying to draw back a little bit to um, also face-to-face -face practices and sort of ways of learning within communities. So, so the writing project model is what I draw back to, or the writing project sort of shared social practices is what I draw back to because it's what I know. Um, but I'm sure there's other places that there are these kind of practices. But, um, you know, it's sort of, I do think it all takes time and practice. And I also think there is, there's like a dual relationship of, practicing, like if you're in a community of practice, like we sort of have a, commun a shared community among us that has shared practices within these online spaces, where are, I don't know, something that Chad Sansing calls spaces of permission that we're supporting new people and kind of entering in. And it's, you know, it's like that, um, what are some of the, um, what are some ways that we can just support people in trying out certain things in those spaces and not doing it all at once? Um, I mean, I think we all know this and all feel this. I'm just trying to think about, like, where do I know this stuff when it's not online? Like, where have I seen it work really well? Where um, communities can continually bring on new people in shared spaces and have... And, and have really robust conversations that expand everybody's experience and not just a group come together and learn some things and then you stay a group, right? So communities of practice literature is one of those places, I think, that we, we have some knowledge base around this. I think inquiry as a way to enter into these conversations and what do we know about that work. So anyway, in my, I've been... Ian, because I think this is such an important question, I keep like trying to draw back to that stuff and connect it to what we're learning online. And I'm not sure if I'm successfully doing that, but that's sort of where I'm seeking that kind of guidance and um, where I draw inspiration from. Like it's possible, I do think it takes time. None of this is speedy. <laughs> but I do think we actually know a lot about it. So, and just wondering how to draw it all together. Well, and, and just to connect to, to Ian's uh, story earlier, maybe looking at the high school for where there are, like, open practices already happening would be a place to say, you know, those teachers seem ready to bring technology in, right? I don't know, but you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to bridge between what Christina said and what you yeah, said earlier. Probably. No, you're, you're, oh, sorry, I just you're right, Paul, and even mm -hmm. though I'm working on a project that's it's focused on technology, I said to everyone, can we just take technology out of this and focus exactly on what you're talking about? What are the, it's not best practices, but what's what are we doing that's really great, that's engaging students, and <laughs> let's go backwards? And then ask them, oh, okay, so how could we integrate technology? That's that's being open. Sorry, go on, Lee, I interrupted. No, no, uh, I was just going to say that's it all goes back to the instructional design. And so I, I think it's, it's about, you know, offering something that is of worth that people are going to get something out of. And then it's enough about knowing who, for me, who my students are. And fortunately, I have few enough that I can get to know, you know, who they are and what they need so that I can try to be sure that that experience gives them whatever that is. Um, and part of it is just attacking the problem from many different sides. 
And so uh, it was the community of inquiry, community of practice, I think is a great place to start. I think there are some things in connectivism now. I'll be the first to say that I designed my first MOOC as if uh, that, you know, that first article on connectivism, that first study that some of you were even involved in that class, I think, um, was a Bible. And I went by it as if this is the theory and I am going to follow it and it is going to work. And it did not. It did not in a huge way. <laughs> it failed miserably. And, uh, but I learned a lot from that. But I do think connectivism has things to give to us, as I think uh, transformative learning has and, and passion-based learning. There's something in that literature that can help. But, I, you know, I've been teaching online for 20 years, and I remember back when, and it hadn't been that long ago, people in my department used to treat me like I was doing something absolutely horrible to the students by making them be on a discussion board in Blackboard and do that three days a week. That that was absolutely unreasonable, it was horrible, and I was a terrible person for doing that. And, you know, that time passed. And then several years ago, um, you know, the feeling was I was doing something absolutely horrible to my students by having them blog in the open and get a Twitter account and having them post on demonic Twitter. Okay, and so, but that has passed. And now it's becoming more and more the norm. And even very, very conservative universities, uh, such as Liverpool and Roehampton, with whom I work are looking at this and saying, okay, how do we make t make the next step in instructional design? Because Blackboard is going by the wayside. There are these organic PLNs that are growing. How do I then move our content into those? It's so interesting that you said that, um, Lee, because I was having the same issue when I was at Georgia Southern University. I was the redheaded stepchild uh, for a while because I was using Edmodo uh, for my grad students and my doctoral students, and everybody was like, I can't believe you're doing this. Like, why are you making them work outside? Do they have to also do Blackboard? And I'm like, no, they have their own little space in Edmodo, and, you know, we just report back on grades because we have to. Uh, within Blackboard, and um, mm -hmm. and and I think I think we uh, you definitely make a point here, moving towards that uh, you know ask for forgiveness rather than <laughs> asking for permission. Uh, that's the route I took um, for multiple things, including my dissertation study. Um, you know, when I was at University of Florida, we were trying to get pre-service teachers uh, field experiences and online learning environments and. I ended up having to just say, okay, well, you know, you're not going to get credit for this, but if you want to volunteer for a four-week experience so that you can check out and see this new opportunity, there you have it. And we, we, you know, we talked about open learning. We talked about learning outside the box. We talked about learning not the way that you were taught. <laughs> um, so it was, it was really interesting, and I think that that is a lot of times how um, innovation happens is you have to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's one of the challenges that I've had. It's, um, you know, I, I built up a program here at UNH where we don't use Blackboard. I, I shun, actively shun uh, Blackboard and, and use my own tools. And, and you know, uh, Verena's taught in the program. We have students that basically have their own blogs. They host their own domains. They leave the program and they, they want to be entrepreneurs. Um, and it's really awesome. It's empowering to see them want to have a real digital footprint, a real digital identity, but it's the same thing. You know, it was, you know, people would say, well, why don't you use Blackboard? Like, why do you, so your first class, do you have everybody create a Wikispace account and sign in? Like, why, why would you do that to yourself? Um, you know, and I was the same person that, uh, you know, would blog and blog, you know, blog drafts of papers before I send them out. Um, and then three years ago, I, uh, was presenting, you know, a, a MOOC that, that I built, my first MOOC, and, and I had a colleague that I really adore, uh, and she basically was like, why the hell do you do this? Like, why do you create MOOCs? Like, why would you blog about this stuff? Um, and, that, and that, in higher ed, it's beautiful because, mm -hmm. you know, I talk to colleagues, I talk to doc students, and they say, you know, 
they're being advised, many of my colleagues and doc students are getting advised by, you know, their advisors, don't blog, don't post openly online. You're not going to get tenure, you're not going to get this, you're not going to get that. Save those precious ideas. You know, ring them dry. Um, and it's and that's part of the challenge. So I, 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 I hope, I pray that we're in between two models and at some point, as, as Lee suggested and Catherine suggested, we'll get to a better place. But I don't know. Okay, uh, maybe um, we need to invite a bunch of uh, Walk My World people um, on sometime soon. Yeah. But can you say, yeah, I mean, because I, can you say a little more about where that experience fits in, in the models you were talking about? Yeah, so basically what happened was um, every year at NCTE we would, uh, Sue Ringler, Pat, Greg McVeary, um, we would do a session on, uh, we wanted teachers to use technology and poetry. And we realized that if we would, uh, to, if we would label or title a session at NCT or any place, something technology, uh, we'd get the people drinking the Kool-Aid. So what we did was we basically, we would call the session like non-traditional narratives or um, poetry response or whatever. And when they would come in the room, we'd shut the doors and say, aha, we're going to talk about poetry now and technology. Um, and so we left NCTE, uh, I think it was two years ago in Boston, and we were talking about focusing on the Poet Laureate, and we were trying to figure out ways to really um, use technology in different ways. So in our discussions, after our session in Boston, we basically said, you know, it would be really cool if we could use technology as a way to openly allow students, you know, have students allow other people to take a walk in their world. And so we were just, you know, brainstorming, and then now what it, it's, involved, it, it's evolved into um, is it's a, a series of instructors, um, and we have... K, you know, pre-service teachers. We also have K-12 educators globally, um, and what we do is we set up uh, ten learning events. And uh, this year is really focusing on identity. We're doing some really cool stuff with identity, and so we put a prompt out there and ask people to read and respond to it. Um, we uh, someday when we grow up, the Walk My World project would like to be the CL MOOC, which to me is the gold standard of of MOOCs. Um, but we have some really cool stuff happening. Uh, we just had uh, a publication come out in uh, the MIT Civic Media Reader, um, and so I can share the learning events. If you look on Twitter right now at uh, pound walk or hashtag walk my world, um, there's some really cool stuff that people are sharing. But it's cool to have um, uh, use technology as a way to have individuals open themselves up and share online. And it's very very interesting. It, we're not only doing it as an open learning experience, but it's also open research. So as we plan, we put the, the planning sessions on the Hangouts, so all the uh, facilitators, you can see us argue about what we should talk, you know, have the learning events be. Um, we write and share our, our research openly. Um, we invite a lot of the facilitators now, we're just participants last year. Um, so we, we're trying to openly connect and openly learn, but openly conduct research as well. And we tell people when we start, you know, we are watching what you're doing, um, and we will collect that data, and we will write about it, and, you know, we're, we're interested in what you're doing. So I'll put a bunch of links in the chat, but it, it's it's a lot of fun. Cool. Can, can you save the link right now, too? Just yep. So I'm I mean, putting verbally. the link. Yeah. <laughs> oh, verbally. Yeah, I have. We're using a Google site for, for better or worse. Well, if if you just if you just Google Walk My World, people will be able to find it. I think, but yeah. Yep. So could could we go? Could we end um, this evening with people? I mean, I I think that was a really good example of um, you use the word open about every other word there. Ian, I don't know if you noticed, but <laughs> um, it's a verbal and, tick now. Yeah, right. I, I was normal before, and then I spent a lot of time talking to Verena, and now it's like open this, open that. 
<laughs> All right. So, but so what I'm asking is if we could go around one more time and, and somebody say something and, and just just to talk about an example of a positive open project that you're working on. Quickly, Christina, can you start us off with that? Sorry to put you on the spot, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, positive open. Anything you want to though, too. Any, any, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, um. I feel like CL MOOC is a really exciting and inspiring project that I, what I'm seeing is it's spinning off other, well, I mean, and CL MOOC is inspired by other MOOCs. So, I mean, I just see this, this one leading to the other, leading to the next, leading to the next, and they're all intersecting. So that, that's very exciting to me. The, the ecosystem that's growing up um, as these moves start to interconnect. And then I love what Ian just said about the research, like being, there's so much conversation about data and privacy and security and um, especially where I am, I'm at South by Southwest EDU right now. Um, so that's on my mind. And then this sort of like being open about that, those practices, those data practices, I feel like are so, it's so important in this ecosystem as we're building it. So. Nice. Thank you. Joe. Oh, I would echo that. I think the first thing that comes to mind is CL MOOC and then figure, and then, you know, because it's a community more than it's a course, it's not a course, it's a collaboration. So just wondering what the community is going to bring to it is, you know, is, is what I look forward to. And then the other thing that I that I was lucky enough to be part of initiating was just initiating a hashtag about ed tech and equity called Techquity. And so just one day I just posted on Twitter that I thought we want that we needed a way to sort of tag our conversations about how equity considerations arise in the ed tech world. And some of the some of the contributions have just been, you know, really cool and it's been fun for me to to reference it because it you know it resonates with people but it also um, it, it brings out so many different viewpoints that that broaden my horizons about equity so as much as I wanted to talk about it in a sort of a localized way to the extent that a hashtag is localized it's like every new contributor just sort of like opens my eyes to another another notion of the importance of equity in ed tech so Somebody mentioned knowledge spillover earlier, and it sounds like that's what you're describing. Um, yeah. With that. Mm -hmm. Karen, any thoughts? Can I go last? Yep. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Catherine. Great. So um, I guess coming from where I'm at uh, in the research area, I tend to look at open learning um, with research and, and trying to research what's going on and how we define openness. Um, one of the big key pieces is to, you know, have those open research conversations like Ian was talking about and also be transparent about sharing out what we're learning and also learning from one another because, uh, you know, that silo effect uh, uh, does not work well neither in the classroom nor in the research community. So. Uh, that's really where uh, I see openness going as being transparent and open to learning from other people. Cool. Lee? Well, I'm just uh, excited about continuing to experiment in my little modest corner of the open with, with my students. Um, and seeing the kind of connections that they make. And I do try to get them to dip their toes into other experiences and other MOOCs um, and use those resources. But but really what I'd like to see is them to build a PLN that exists beyond the class and beyond the program so that, you know, they just continue to learn throughout. Um, and our GiverCraft experience is a lot of fun. Um, and we we're doing that right now and we're just welcoming people to come because with the kids, with the 6th through 12th graders, I think it's so exciting for our students in Alaska to meet other kids from around the world, some of whom have never left their villages um, and won't until college. And so it's just great to have other people in the world with them and, and I hope that, that people would consider that and 
and it's uh, yes, it's givercraft.com. And so we are doing the giver right now, and it's about to end. But then we'll start the Maze Runner and Lord of the Flies, all aligned with Common Core. <laughs> well, that's good. But assessed by educators. And craft is <laughs> Minecraft, or what was the craft part of it? It is Minecraft. Yes, we're doing it in yeah. Minecraft EDU. We have a server, and we can handle up to a thousand people at a time. So come on, we'd love to have you build. Wow, a lot more to follow up on there. Great, thank you. For that. Thank you, yeah. Rhonda. Well, you know, uh, I, I like Marina. I come to this more from the philosophy of open than from the OER perspective. So. Uh, I really am interested in opportunities to continue to share the idea of open, to spread the open love, as I say it. Um, I'm, I'm doing an open OER course with EdTech BC, but uh, for me, it also leads to opportunities for play in the open. Lee was kind of alluding to that too. So uh, I guess other things other than sharing the open love, um, I just finished a, a radio play for DS106. Uh, who are looking at noir, film noir right now. So uh, for me, open also is these, uh, being open has opened opportunities for me. So in addition to mm. opportunities for me to grow as a person and for my students to grow and things like that, just crazy opportunities to participate in um, fun things like radio plays with people I have never met um, that I have a really fun time with. So. Uh, open as a philosophy as well as an educational principle. Cool. Thank you. Verena. Um, I'm thinking of something that, again, Doug Belshaw said a while ago, and, and his uh, over or underlying reason for being here is he just knows instinctually that this is what he should be doing. <laughs> and I think being open... Um, and I liked kind of, Ian, what you were saying before, like, you're right, I, my personality and my behavior and who I am obviously is um, open <laughs> and has always been open and now I have this ability to be more open in an open, in the, in the, using the internet and digital tools um, and now I'm coming to a point where people actually are listening and taking me seriously and I'm not just the alien on another planet which I've blogged about and spoken about before so when you are taken more seriously how are you modeling how are you how are you um, ensuring that other people can understand and listen and more importantly being open enough to listen to them and hear how they need how you need to change your language or change your story or meet their needs or change your metaphor in order to um, create a more open world for everyone. And that's, um, I, I don't know, that I think that will be my challenge, I guess, in the next year. I'm really lucky that people are taking open learning more seriously. Um, and they're, they're looking at it and wondering what are we up to, which is always good. Thank you. Karen, you get last word tonight. Okay. Um, in terms of open practice, the two most, I think, compelling but also personally rewarding um, activities for me that I'm involved in right now are this show and Youth Voices. So I just want to thank Paul and thank everybody in this room and everybody in those communities for really showing what open can be and do. Thank you. Well, I blush. Um, by, by the way, the, um, one of the things that Karen is helping us launch, um, every Friday we do the same thing here with students. Um, we do it Friday at, oh, 10.50. Um, we start gathering Eastern. around 10.50 10, 10 Pacific time, yep, and, which is 1.50 Eastern time. Um, at any rate, um, so there's a lot going on. Thank you all. Well, um, we do this, Teachers Teaching Teachers, each Wednesday um, at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific mm -hmm. time. Um, and what is it up there in Alaska? Is it uh, 5 o'clock in Alaska? Or? It is 6 o'clock <laughs> in Alaska. Yeah, now it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, and uh, we broadcast over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. 
that Dave Cormier and Jeff Levo set up. Um, thank you all, and great conversation, guys. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great conversation. See you soon. Nice to see you all.